Here's a nice record player that we found. It's a Tune Time ORP10, Colster Brands uh, manufactured. It's got a single valve amplifier, which is an ECL82 type volume control and a tone on off switch going to the back of the tone control and we've had it all serviced up it sounds quite nice and healthy very strong it's got a BSR Monarch record deck with a TC8 cartridge um, a crystal type cartridge here we go now we've got the service technician who's going to take you through the circuit diagram Colster Brands Tune Time ORP10 record player amplifier. This is not a basic nasty AC-DC one, it's a proper AC only amplifier. So starting at the beginning, at the pickup terminals, this is for a ceramic pickup, doesn't need the very high output of a crystal, goes straight into the volume control, 500k log, nothing to comment on there, but note that the earthy end isn't earthed. It goes to earth via an 820 ohm resistor. This means that you cannot actually turn the volume down to nothing at all. There will always be something there. But the ratio of the 500k to the 820 ohms is so great that it will be a tiny noise in the background. The reason they have done this is so that negative feedback can be applied from the output. <clears throat> I'll come back to that. So the signal is fed into the triode. Got the blocking capacitor of 0.01 microfarads, and we have 10 mega ohms as a grid leak. There is no cathode bias component down there. A few electrons from the cathode on their way to the anode hit the grid, therefore, the grid is driven negative with respect to ground, and that is how the bias is achieved. That is why they have to have a very high impedance here. There are two disadvantages to doing it this way. Once it's nice and cheap because you don't need components there, the distortion is considerably higher with grid bias. And also, the gain of the stage will be a little bit lower. The 220K anode load resistor means that they're running this for all the gain that they can get out of it. The supply is then decoupled through the 8K2 and a 20 microfarad capacitor, really rather large. The decoupled supply also feeds the screen grid of the ECL82. So the signal is passed across through a 0.05 microfarad. You might think that's the volume control, but we've already had that here. This is a tone control. At the bottom here, we've got 3000 PF or 0.003 microfarads. That's a short circuit at treble frequencies, but it has considerable reactance at um, middle and base. So as you turn this down, it cuts the treble, but makes very little difference to the middle and base. The grid leak for the valve is this 680K here but it does mean that the return path is through the tone control. The disadvantage of that is if this pot goes scratchy, it will be severely scratchy because if this lifts off and there is no um, DC return path for the output valves control grid, um, it will be a big crunch in the speaker. So that is a weakness of this circuit. Conventional bias components in the pentode cathode circuit there. Up here, we've got another 3000 PF in series with 12K. That's the pentode tone compensation. We have this extra winding at the top here of L1. Now, I think we've encountered that on a previous amplifier. It's a cheap way of doing smoothing. So here we've got a reservoir capacitor off the bridge rectifier. There'll be quite a lot of ripple voltage there. So it is fed through this winding in which the hum is induced in antiphase to the effect in the current of the output valve to cancel it. We then have a series smoothing resistor. Now the value of that resistor is somewhat critical if they change the design of the transformer, then you have to change the design of that resistor. 
Now I have a Colster Brands vintage radio in which there are at least five different iterations of the output transformer marked with different color spots. And each one requires a different value of smoothing resistor. Um, why they got themselves into such a confused state, I don't know, but it all became rather complicated about which transformer, which tone circuit, and which smoothing resistor. But anyway, there's the smoothing resistor into a mere 10 microfarads. Now I've checked the original circuit. I thought these two values had been transposed because 20 there and 10 there seems a lot more rational to me, but the original circuit at least says that that is the right way round. The little 10 microfarad is the smoothing and the 20 microfarads is the decoupling. Now, negative feedback I've mentioned via a 4K7 resistor and the 0.1 microfarad. If we take the ratio of the 4K7 to the 820, it's somewhere around six times. So a sixth of the voltage is fed back from the output. But the reactance of this capacitor at most of the audio frequency range is going to be higher than the resistance of the resistor. So basically this is a built-in treble cut circuit because there's a lot more negative feedback at high frequency than at low frequency. In the base end there is basically none at all. Something else I'll point out, um, we've got to the stage where they were getting rid of valves so it doesn't have a valve rectifier. This circuit is simpler, they don't need a, a sense attack transformer, they've got a single HT winding feeding a bridge rectifier. You've got four diodes, I haven't seen them but I'm pretty certain you'd find they're not silicon, that they are um, metal oxide rectifiers, one of those flat packs that's contact called. A bit of confusion on the main side, um, you may well be able to work out what they have done but they've not exactly drawn this well. It's a double pole switch. You are supposed to work out that when you switch this on, that connects to there. So what does that do? Logically, if it connects to a circle, it's going to go to there or there. Well, it doesn't. That connects to this arrow and the arrow selects the mains voltage. But there is ambiguity, even if it's easy to work out what they mean, um, it's not well drawn, not terribly professional. One strange little thing here, you would have thought that that would be marked T1 or TR1 or even OPTR for the output transformer and that would be T2 or MT for the mains transformer. Now in RF practice, they tend not to call transformers transformers, but they simply label the windings as L for inductance. It's not done that often at audio frequency, but here they've decided to call the primary L1, the secondary L2. It does say it's the output transformer. And here on the mains transformer, again, they've given the three windings L numbers instead of simply calling it mains transformer. Not particularly significant, but a variant over standard practice. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date, we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment, starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players, We've also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.